November 30th, 2021 was a day of tragic bloodshed at Oxford High School in Michigan. Four innocent lives taken, four amazing students with the rest of their lives ahead of them murdered in cold blood. Seven more people were shot that day inside the school, but they were able to miraculously survive. But their lives have been changed forever. And the carnage from that day has impacted so many. It's a loss of life that cannot be replaced. But our system of justice can uncover the truth and hold those who are responsible accountable for their actions. The killer was one of their own, a fellow student, a 15-year-old who we refer to not by his name, but by what he did, the Oxford School shooter. He was convicted and sent away for life, but the search for justice is not over. Now prosecutors have also charged his parents with four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Jennifer and James Crumbly are the first school shooter parents to be charged with homicide for the shootings committed by their child. Jennifer was convicted in February. Now James is on trial and all the evidence is in and the arguments have been made and it's time to hear from the jury. Tonight, we take a look at both Crumblies. What did they do? What didn't they do? What is justice? As we continue our investigation of the Oxford school shootings. I'm Benny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And you have to begin anytime you talk about this story, this case, this trial, is acknowledged the absolute tragedy that took place in Oxford High School. The loss of life, four great lives, four young people with incredible futures ahead of them had already accomplished so much and were getting ready to do so much more. And they're gone. Madison, Tate, Justin, and Hannah, all gone. Four bright souls because of one evil person. Now the shooter has been convicted. He's gone. He's locked up. Out of the conversation. And I think we're at that point right now in this country. School shooters, when convicted, go away. And they're gone forever gone. But we're at a different point now. And this case and this trial is at a different place. Obviously, it's about what he did. And it's also about why he did it. And why he wasn't stopped. And we're talking about his parents now. The extension of criminal responsibility beyond just the person who is squeezing the trigger. Beyond the student, the child, who is squeezing the trigger and taking those lives. In this case, we've extended the criminal responsibility beyond to his parents. Now, why do you do this? It's, it's, this is a problem school shootings in this country that everyone is looking everywhere for a way to just stop it from happening. And in this respect, what this prosecution team is doing is saying this could have been prevented, this should have been prevented, and his parents knew that this could happen. Jennifer Crumbly, the mother, she's been convicted. You saw the trial here on Court TV. You heard the evidence, you saw her response, you heard her testimony trying to explain her actions and her inactions. But the jury didn't agree, the jury said, no, 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 no. No, we, 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 you need to do better. You gotta wake up, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility as a parent, especially when you know that there are deadly weapons in the house. You've got to open your eyes, open your ears, open your mind and understand what is going on in your child's life. 
And when you get calls from school and your child is doing things, you need to pay attention. And by the way, you also have to think, oh, wait a minute, he's drawing pictures of guns? We have a gun, he has a gun. We purchased it for him, sort of illegally. We have some responsibility here. Talk to your son. Make sure he's not bringing the gun. Find out what's on his mind. Get him help. Make that your top priority. Not working, not riding horses, not having affairs. Your top priority is and always should be your child. And if your child is troubled, wow, do something. And I don't know how the solution to a, a, a troubled child is buying him a gun. And that's what the jury said. And this is a, this is a landmark case. Are parents around the country waking up? We're all concerned about our kids going to school and being safe, but you also have to be conscious of the fact of, okay, do we have deadly weapons at home? If so, is my child okay? Are my weapons secure? Because look out, look out. After this case, it's a different ball game, folks. Completely different ball game for responsibility because of the problem. Everyone's looking for a solution. This is called deterrence. We need to deter parents from not keeping an eye on their children and being responsible gun owners and understanding what's going on with your child and helping your child and making the school aware if there are issues and making the school aware of, oh yeah, we have a gun. Let's just make sure he doesn't have it with him today. He's been drawing pictures, talking about blood everywhere, was shopping for bolts the day before. We just took him to the range. He was begging, begging, begging for this gun, like he really wanted the gun. Wake up. That's what this is. This is the wake up time. James Crumbly, now it's dad's turn. We'll see if the jury, this, a, a different jury, comes to the same conclusion for the dad. Right? Two juries, can, they, I mean, juries can see things differently. The reason we put these type of cases and all our cases in front of a jury of peers because they're the ones who have to decide what's okay and what's not okay. And the, the significance and importance of this case is, okay, what responsibility do parents have for the carnage caused by their child? Big day today in court. The evidence was going in. The closing arguments were being made. Here are the biggest moments. James Crumbly is not on trial for what his son did. James Crumbly is on trial for what he did and what he didn't do. A parent has a legal duty to exercise reasonable care to prevent the minor child from intentionally harming others or prevent the minor child from conducting themselves in a way that creates a reasonable risk of harm to others. He doesn't get a pass because you don't think the teachers did enough. He doesn't get a pass for that. And the blame shifting is only meant to send a message, I'm not accountable here at all. Even though I bought the weapon. Even though I didn't secure it. Even though I never got help from my son. Even though I could have taken him that day. We have the text between James Crumbly's son and his friend about exactly what he wrote about in the journal. He hears people talking to someone in the distance. I actually told my dad, asked my dad to take me to the doctor yesterday, but he just gave me some pills and told me to suck it up. He failed to perform his legal duty to prevent these kids from being killed. And I ask that you find him guilty.
for a variety of emotions following the shooting on November 30th of 2021 at Oxford High School. Terror, anger, and devastation. On December 3rd of 2021, the parents of a school shooter were charged with involuntary manslaughter for the first time. This case is not about what happened inside of Oxford High School. This case is about what happened outside of Oxford High School. This case is about what James Crumley knew on and before November 30th of 2021. The prosecution is asking you to second guess the decisions made. You heard no testimony and you saw no evidence that James had any knowledge that his son was a danger to anyone. That James Crumbly knew what his son was planning. That James Crumbly was aware that his son knew where the firearms in the home were hidden. No one testified that immediate parental intervention was necessary on November 30th of 2021 during the meeting with Sean Hopkins and Nick Ejack. No one testified that there was a need for immediate intervention of any kind. Please, follow the law. Review the evidence. Review the instructions. And follow the law. Because I'm confident that if you do that, each of you will have at least one reasonable doubt. And your vote will be not guilty. Not an easy case for prosecutors to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Court TV legal correspondent Kelly Kraft joining us live from Pontiac, Michigan tonight. Kelly, great to see you. What a big day. What an important case. Uh, tell us about the latest from deliberations today. Good evening, Vinny. The jurors, they only deliberated for a very short time today. The defense did put on one witness. We heard from James Crumley's sister who talked about that she didn't notice anything out of the ordinary with her nephew, Ethan. Then the jurors really heard the closing arguments and even the judge asked them after closing arguments if they wanted to take a little break before she gave them jury instructions. They said no. They wanted to get right to deliberating Vinny. And so then they began their deliberations. Then around quarter to five we got a notice that they were going to be ending their deliberations for the day. The judge even said to them that they could go as late as they wanted but then they decided at about quarter to five that they were going to end for the day and they are going to resume again tomorrow morning. But they do have a lot to sort through in this case. And they have to deal with a lot of words here. Negligence, foreseeability, the duty, what James Crumley did, what James Crumley didn't do. And it depends on whose arguments that they're going to feel were more compelling and what the evidence showed here in this case. Of course, the prosecutor argued that I do not have to prove that James Crumley knew because that was one of the main things defense counsel argued. There's no evidence that James Crumley knew that his son was troubled and needed help. But the prosecutor said, I don't have to prove that. What I have to prove is that even if he was unaware, he should have been aware. What would an ordinary, reasonable person have known? Especially, she said, Vinny, when you took a look at that math worksheet in which Ethan Crumley drew that picture of that person that had that gunshot wound on him and blood oozing out with a lot of different words on that sheet of paper, the prosecutor left the jurors with that image again, saying that someone should have known. Uh, yeah, I think everyone sitting in that room should have done more. Everyone, the parents and the school. School's not on trial here. I'm sure there's civil cases that will uh, deal with that issue. Um, so let's talk about this jury, because um, that's important, right? Every jury's a little bit different. Um, what do we know about this jury? Vinny, this jury appears to be very different than the jury for Jennifer Crumley. Of course, we were here covering the Jennifer Crumley case. That was a few months ago, and it was freezing cold here in Michigan. Now, today, it was about 70 degrees, so much different time and much different set of jurors. The jurors in Jennifer Crumley's case took tons of notes. We always noticed them feverishly taking notes. Here in James Crumley's trial, I haven't noticed a lot of note takers. Some, of course, are taking a few notes here and there. One of the big things that I noticed was the crime 
crying yesterday when they played that video of when Ethan Crumley emerges from the bathroom and began that terrible rampage. A lot of those jurors, though, today, three of them were dismissed. So now what we have is the jury. They were the alternates. The jury is six women, six men, Vinny. Most of them are married. Most are gun owners. One of the women on the jury is expecting. So that's the makeup of the jury here. But of course, listening to both sides uh, very closely. And again, different reactions than when we had this case last time with Jennifer Crumley. And we had a different defense counsel on that case. This time we have the same prosecution team, but a different defense counsel. So it's interesting to watch the different reactions between the two. Uh, I would say on the issue of gun owners, not good for the defense because responsible gun owners know how to keep their guns safe and out of the hands of their children. And obviously that didn't happen here. If it did, he never would have gotten the gun. So um, if I was the defense, I wouldn't like gun owners on this jury. But I understand that part of Michigan, lots of folks are. So you're going to have to deal with it. Um, now. You had an opportunity to speak with the attorney who's representing uh, some of the victims' families. I did, Vinny. This is Wolf Mueller, and we talked with him during Jennifer Crumley's case as well. Got a chance to talk with him today. He represents the family, the mother of Madison Baldwin and another victim of the school shooting. Let's listen to what he had to say. The jurors heard enough about his relationship, for example, when the shooter told his dad, I need help, and he said, suck it up, here's some, here's some medication. That kind of callousness, the jurors heard enough of that. You, you tie that into what happened the day of the shooting when they're in the conference room. And the important thing that I found was everybody else rushed to the school to see if their kid was okay. He went home to see if his kid had taken the gun. No one else mentioned anybody who could be the shooter except James Crumbly. I thought that was huge. And the fact that he and his wife abandoned their child and tried to flee and were found hiding in Detroit in a warehouse, uh, that spoke volumes to me. And Vinnie, what Wolf was referring to there is then after the school shooting, how James and Jennifer Crumley left town. They left here in Pontiac, Michigan, and then they went to Detroit. They were staying in an art studio. The prosecutor was talking about that during closing arguments, saying they took money out, $6,000 out of the bank, and they were hiding out in that art studio, basically abandoning their son. Now, I will say defense counsel did get a point in there. This was during her questioning of one of the detectives in which she asked him about confronting James Crumley that one morning when they ended up finding them inside that art studio. And he even admitted that it was possible that James Crumley was going to be turning himself in that morning at 7 a.m. But she didn't really, defense counsel really didn't talk too much about that during closing arguments, but the prosecutor sure did talking about them taking off after their son committed the school shooting. Wow. Powerful stuff. And Vinny, and Vinny, you know, I, I want to say we did get a chance to, um, last time when we were here during Jennifer Crumley's trial, we talked with a lot of the parents of the victims. And this time as well, uh, one of our affiliates got a chance to talk with one of the victim's mothers. This is Madison Baldwin's mother. And I believe we have that. We could, we could play that for you. It's not really hard to hear the defense. It's, it's hard to relive it every single time. That's the, that's the hardest thing. Um, you know, just every time you see something, it's, it's different. Every time you hear something, it's different. And it just gets harder and harder. Um, and I, I, you know, it's for all the families. Like, you, there's things that we, we least expect, and then there's things that we thought we were going to expect, and it's not what we thought it was going to be. Um, and, you know, we're parents, so it's... It's hard to see some of these things parents do. And Vinny, you, you can only imagine what these parents have been through. They've had to sit through this now three times. They had the Miller hearing. This was for Ethan Crumley when they were deciding whether or not he could be tried and sent to prison without the possibility of parole. Of course, that's the sentence he did end up receiving. So the parents sat through that. Then they sat through Jennifer Crumley's hearing, or trial rather, and now they're 
sitting through James Cromley's trial. So three times they've had to relive this. Probably they, they relive it over and over again in their head. But hearing it, even us sitting here again in court as they're putting up the pictures of the victims and seeing it again and again and the constant reminder, it, it's just such a tragic situation. It's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. Let's talk about uh, Jennifer Crumbly now. She, she was convicted. What's going on with her now? And Vinny, she is in the county jail. So right where we cover this court case at the Oakland County Courthouse, she is in the county jail right there. Her sentencing is going to be April 9th. She faces up to 15 years in prison. Of course, they're going to have to take a look at the guidelines here and also the fact, so it was a severe crime. There were four people that ended up dying. She was convicted of involuntary manslaughter. But she does not have a criminal history. So there's no criminal record. And of course, that's extremely important in sentencing. So what the judge ends up deciding, we'll have to wait and see. But of course, I, I'm pretty certain Karen McDonald, the prosecutor in this case, will probably be asking for the maximum, which is that 15 years. And then defense counsel will try to get a lesser sentence. But it's pretty certain she will at least serve a few years behind bars, if not the maximum. Yeah, that, and, and that's a lot of range. I mean, you know, a year, two years to 15 years, that's a lot of time. So it's an important hearing. Uh, Kelly Kraft, I know you got a big, big day tomorrow starting at 8.30. Verdict Watch continues. As we know here at Court TV, a verdict can happen at any moment. They may have reached a verdict today and wanted to sleep on it. It could be first thing in the morning on Julie Grant's show. So, uh, Kelly, thank you so much.